We are continuing on in a series that we have been in for about a month or so now, um, looking at different aspects of discipleship. We, um, we want to be a church filled with disciples who make disciples. Um, we've looked at seri several pieces of that. The, the foundational piece of that is the person of Jesus. Um, that a disciple is made when they are transformed by the death and the resurrection of Jesus, receiving forgiveness through his death and uh, new life through his resurrection. And then, um, as disciples, we're called to learn and to grow in that. Uh, and we've looked at three major pieces of how that happens. One is proclamation, that we are shaped by the, uh, the written word of God that points us to the living word of God, which is Christ, which then changes our spoken words so that through our speech, um, we are always pointing others toward Christ. Um, we've also looked at the piece of prayer um, and, and with this idea of do, do our prayers reflect the prayers of Jesus and his priorities in prayer? Are we persistent in prayer based on an accurate and true perspective of who God is? And then last week we looked at this idea of people, that all of us are called to be engaged in, the, in this and that the process of discipleship uh, is a community effort. And so now today and next week, we're going to finish out the series just by kind of putting a couple of caveats on these three major pieces of proclamation, prayer, and people. And today's caveat, today's characteristic is perseverance. In other words, as we grow and learn in, in Jesus, these are not things that happen overnight. Um, the Christian life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's something that um, we get up and we engage in day after day, after week, after week, after month, after uh, month, after year, after year, after decade, after decade. It, it, it happens over a long time. And so if we don't learn perseverance in that, um, it'll be a, a, a long road. Um, we could, we could uh, think about perseverance, as one person has put it, as simply um, stick to itiveness, sticking to something, enduring in something. Um, we'll look at a little more of that in, in a minute. Um, it's the realization that the Christian life is not an easy life, that we don't get our best life now. That our best life is to come in the next life. Now, I, I don't want to pretend like I'm some expert in perseverance. Um, I've had things in my life that have been hard. Um, but I recognize that there are people in this room who have had far more difficult things than I've had in my life. Um, I want to put one of those people out for us this morning. Um, and that's my, my good friend Damon over here. Damon knew I was going to do this. I'm not surprised. Um, Damon's walked through some difficult things. I've told Damon before that when the bullets start flying around me, I'm going to go jump in his foxhole because he's used to bullets flying around. Um, one of the things you may not know about Damon is that Damon is a master fisherman. Not kidding. In fact, uh, he has a following on YouTube where he uh, places these videos that teaches people different techniques and approaches to fishing. And he sent me one a few weeks ago, and I said, this is perfect for our upcoming sermon on perseverance because it highlights so very well um, what life feels like oftentimes. So I want us to watch it this morning and let David lead the way. Philosophy Fridays. Yesterday was one of those days, man. I went fishing. Somebody wanted to have a fishing video on drift fishing, so that was going to be the goal, right? Boats on the side plate when the engine backed out. Oil starts spewing, and fortunately there's no damage to the engine. I had to row all the way back about three miles. Once the wind started picking up, I started rowing really hard. About two-thirds of the trip back to the boat, bam, oar broke. Let me show you. Oar <laughs> broke, man. Seriously, it just cracked, snapped. You know, snap, crackle, pop. And fortunately, I had my paddle. I paddled all the way back to the dock. That was miserable. Not to mention, 
that when I got back home and checked the camera, I never even turned the microphone on. <laughs> have basically no footage. So what are we going to do? We may just turn that video into a rap video or something. <laughs> <laughs> talking about um, inspirational feel-good stories. I'm talking about perseverance in Christ that is leading toward eternal life. All right, so I don't want to just give some motivational, inspirational speech today. I'm talking about perseverance in the Christian life uh, as we walk with Christ. So, so I'm talking about the path that goes through Jesus. We, we may have some here today, you're not on that path. You've never put your faith in Jesus. Um, and so I would extend to you today that um, Jesus is inviting you onto his path. That, that the path that you're on that is not found in Christ, it, it leads to destruction. And so the only path in which there is uh, life and hope is on the path that Jesus is on. And so it's perseverance on that path that I'm talking about today. Okay? Um, we are continuing on in Luke and Acts, okay? So this is kind of our textual background for this uh, sermon series. There's, a, there's an outline on the back of your bulletin if you're a, a blank filler in her. Um, you, can, you can do that um, just to kind of keep up with uh, us. Um, we're going to jump around a little bit in text today, but we're going to um, kind of start off in Acts chapter 2. Before we get there, um, the first blank we're going to look at is I just want to unpack a little more um, what perseverance is. So this is number one. The morning outline is just what perseverance is. We've talked about that already, just a little bit, uh, but I want to just unpack it a little bit further. Uh, and to do to do that, I want to start at the end of 
uh, the chapter that we looked at last week, Acts chapter 2. Um, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47 says this. And they, this is referencing the followers of, of, of Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, <coughs> praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Um, very fascinating picture of the early church here. We have, we have activities that they were involved in. We have uh, characteristics that define uh, the early picture of, of the church and what they were uh, doing. But the, the thing that, that uh, I want us to focus in on this is a word that pops out uh, very early on in verse 42 uh, is the word devoted. They devoted themselves to, and then boom, it goes into this long explanation. Now, uh, this word devoted is where we get the, the idea of endurance or perseverance. It is uh, a word that's a part of a family of words that's used throughout the, uh, the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, to, to emphasize continuing on in something. Um, we see this in the Hebrews 12 verses that we've been looking at, right? That Jesus himself had to endure, he had to uh, persevere, he had to devote himself to the reason that, that he was sent here by God the Father. And that we are to imitate this in our own endurance. Um, Hebrews 11, which obviously comes right before Hebrews 12, which has already been referenced today, gives this whole long list of uh, saints that have gone before in the Old Testament. And uh, Moses, it talks about there, it says, Moses endured in what he was called to do to lead the of God out of Egypt. And he endured because he recognized who God was more than who Pharaoh was. So this word is, is applied to him. Um, most often we see these words, devoted, endurance, perseverance. Most often in the scriptures we see this family of words applied to prayer. Um, in fact, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Luke chapter 11. And this idea of persisting in prayer. That's the same uh, word family there. It's the same thing that we, that we persist in prayer and we keep going in prayer. And so these, these words are used all throughout the uh, New Testament in particular to emphasize continuing on in something. But we need to understand how we're able to continue on and what it is that the Lord has called us to continue on in. The reality is, is that perseverance is not about any strength that I have to offer. If, if we think that persevering in the Christian life is about pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and gritting our teeth in order to continue on in the faith, and we don't understand perseverance. What, what perseverance is about is not continuing on in our own strength, but it's continuing on in the strength that Christ provides. So we see in Acts 2, how are they able to devote themselves to uh, all these activities they're doing? What flows out of what happens at the beginning of Acts 2, which we looked at last week, where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. Um, how is it that we are told to endure in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? By looking to Jesus who endured. How is it that Moses was able to endure? Because he regarded God more than he regarded Pharaoh. What is it that is exactly at the heart of prayer? Prayer is uh, not looking to my own strength, but it's recognizing that in my weakness I go and I uh, express my desire to walk in the strength that the Lord offers. Perseverance is not about us pulling it off. J.I. Packer, in his book on systematic theology, says it this way. Perseverance means persistence under discouragement and contrary pressure. The assertion that believers persevere in faith and obedience despite everything is true. But the reason is that Jesus Christ, through the Spirit, persists in preserving them. This is so important for us to understand. This is exactly what Paul means, or the author of Hebrews means, when he says that Jesus is not only the founder of our faith, but He's also the perfecter of our faith. We don't get saved, and then we go trying about our own strength to live out the Christian life. It doesn't work like that. 
We, we, we live out the Christian life by grace through faith, which is the same way we came into the Christian life. Very important to understand. All right, so here's what we're going to do next. There's perseverance. Um, part two is, I want to show us some examples, okay? So from Acts, uh, part number two here is I want to look at what is it that perseverance creates? What does perseverance create? Now, um, this is a little bit like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? So um, each of these things that we're going to list in number two, we can also say that maybe each of these things creates perseverance, right? So it kind of goes either way. You could, you could say um, either way. Um, and so we're going to do that by looking at multiple examples in Acts of what perseverance creates. So we're going to go through this um, hopefully as quickly as we can. Um, now you might look at that picture of the early Christian community in Acts chapter 2 and say to yourself, man, that just sounds great. I mean, they're just, everybody's going good and an early Christian community looks wonderful and uh, everybody's just kind of doing great. Uh, I wish I could have been a part of that. Well, maybe not. Um, because as you continue looking on in Acts, things get hard. <laughs> and they actually get hard really quickly in chapter 3. In chapter 3, uh, we see that Peter and John healed this lame man on the steps of the uh, temple and they invoked the name of Jesus to do this. And the religious leaders of the day, they don't appreciate it. And so uh, they bring Peter and John into uh, uh, kind of a court setting, and they chastise them and discipline them and uh, uh, kind of threaten them uh, very severely. Um, so much so that when Peter and John are finally released, they go back to a house where a bunch of believers are, and they start praying for boldness because they are scared. One of the things that perseverance creates, this is letter A, is courage. Courage. The Christian life is wrought with danger. It is uh, wrought with fear. It is wrought with risk. And one of the things that we are called to develop in our faith is a courage. Now, courage, um, as it has been said, is not the absence of fear. It is exercising faith in the face of fear. So if you think that at any point in your Christian life that, you're, that things that, are, that make you scared are going to go away, just... Chunk that thought. That's not going to happen. You're going to face situations that are scary from this day until the day that you die. So it's, it's not that we develop courage in our faith by removing everything that, that, that's scary. It's that the Lord wants us to learn to exercise faith in Him in the face of the things that are scary. Courage. As we persevere in Christ, one of the things that He develops in us is Courage. All right. All right. Letter B. Second one we're going to look at. So uh, A was courage. B is commissioning. Commissioning. Um, if we keep going in Acts, we will find in Acts chapter seven that the first Christian is killed for his faith, and that is uh, Stephen. Stephen is martyred. Interestingly, there's a guy who's uh, standing by, kind of overseeing this process, named Saul. And uh, as a result of this martyrdom of Stephen. A lot of the followers that were connected to Stephen, they disperse. They scatter. And uh, if we keep reading in Acts and we get to the last part of Acts chapter 11, we'll see that one of the places they scatter to is a place called Antioch. Do we have that map? We got a map today. Let's see if I can report this thing. Um, here's Jerusalem. Down here. Um, my hand's a little jittery this morning because I was coughing all night and I took cough syrup so this morning so I'm a little jittery. Sorry about that. You see this jittery? There's Jerusalem. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and laugh. There you go. All right. Your pleasure. Um, so here's Jerusalem down here. Antioch is up here. So they scatter. That's not jittery. That's actually me circling now. Okay, so they, 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 uh, they disperse to Antioch. And actually, we're told in the last part of chapter 11 that um, there's actually a, a pretty solid, strong church that, that crops up in Antioch. And then here's what's fascinating. If we keep reading on into uh, chapter 13, we see that Paul and Barnabas, Paul who's now been converted, they go to the church at Antioch. Let's leave that up there just one second. Sorry, Paul. Um, they, go to, they go to this church, and it's from this church that they are commissioned into their missionary journeys. You can see why, right? So, again, Jerusalem down here. Antioch's right here, and they're, they're commissioned to all these places over here where they're eventually going to go and spread the gospel. By the time that Acts ends, 
Paul is over here in Rome. So you see Antioch is a really good launching point between Jerusalem and these uh, Gentile territories in the Roman Empire. So what we see here is that in perseverance, the church that was persecuted and perseveres, I'm going to take that down now, um, that eventually this leads into a commissioning of an advancement of the gospel to all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And here's the reality. Every single one of us is commissioned. Every single one of us. Now, it might not be in the dramatic state or form in which Paul and Barnabas were commissioned, but you are commissioned. And you might ask, uh, to whom and to where am I commissioned? Wherever it is you will be this week. Whatever space it is that you occupy on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, you're commissioned there. So if you um, go to a workplace every day and you interact with people there, you're commissioned there. If you're in school and you're a student and you interact with people there, you're commissioned there. If you stay at home with your children, you are commissioned there. Whatever spaces you occupy in your life, day-to-day, week-to-week, that's where you're commissioned. It's not just leaders who are commissioned. It's not just pastors. It's not just missionaries. We're all commissioned to a particular people in a particular place. Now, that's, that's not easy, right? Being commissioned in those places sometimes is difficult. Whether it's in the realm of parenting or whether it's in the realm of getting along with a difficult boss or whether it's whatever it is, that can, be, that can be difficult. So perseverance is a part of that. But make no mistake, we are all commissioned. We are all commissioned to be disciples where we're at and to make disciples where we're at. All right. Um, we had courage. We had commissioning. This third word, I love this third word. Oh, yeah. Anybody ever heard of that word? It's a good word. The word concord. I had to stick with CO words, right? Of course. Um, Concord is a word that means unity. Unity. Um, one of the things we find when we look at the book of Acts um, is that one of the most significant issues in the early church was here you had uh, predominantly in the past God's people being predominantly made up of the Jewish people and now God is unleashing himself through Christ to be taken to the Gentiles. Um, and so that creates issues. Um, if you were around in the summer when we were going through Galatians, you saw some of those issues that it created, right? So what transfers over and what doesn't transfer over and how does the law work and all this kind of stuff. We covered that over the summer, right? So, so they have to figure this out in Acts. And there's multiple um, layers or levels they have to go through. So we see this first off in Acts chapter 10. God shows up to Peter in a vision. Uh, Peter goes and shares uh, Christ with some Gentiles. They come to faith, and Peter's like, oh, wow, this is a big deal. So he has to go back and communicate this to the, uh, the Christian leadership in Jerusalem. Later on in Acts chapter 15, after Paul has gone on some missionary journeys, he comes back and checks in with the apostles in Jerusalem, just to kind of make sure that they jive on what they're communicating and, and what the message is that they're, that they're spreading. And so, and so through this, through their perseverance to advance God's plans and purposes, what they're learning is what it is that unifies them. Oh, that's so important. I think there's a lot of churches that create a lot of unity that's not based in who Jesus is. I think there's a lot of churches whose unity is based in everybody kind of being the same. We all kind of make about the same amount of money. We all kind of live kind of similar lives. We're all the same skin color. I think a lot of churches' unity is based in those kind of things. It's easy to create unity around us. Real easy. What perseverance shows us, though, is that true unity is around the person and the work of Jesus. So it's easy. We really don't have to persevere much when we're all kind of looking sound the same. Unity becomes much more fun and much more challenging when we say, we're going to unite around Christ and let all who come, come. Boy, I hope that's who we are as a church. We're not uniting around having similar interests or personalities or backgrounds or whatever. But we're uniting around the person who works with Jesus. 
Hmm, it's a big deal. All right, number four. Number four is comfort. Comfort. Perseverance creates comfort. Uh, Acts chapter 18, Paul has been out on the road for a while. Uh, Paul's typical approach in any town that he goes to is to start in the local synagogue where there are Jewish people and other people who are seeking God. Um, and then he kind of moves out from, from there to share um, the gospel message. And in Acts chapter 18, Paul is um, sharing with some Jews in the synagogue, and they don't really have much to do with him. And Paul, I mean, a screw comes loose. I, it, seriously, I mean, he, he, he goes nuts. I, he might be experiencing burnout. Because I, he, I mean, he, he, Paul doesn't mince words. He's like, man, I'm done with you people. I'm going to Gentiles. Y'all don't listen to nothing. I mean, he, he, cool. Go read. I mean, this is a big deal. And so we see Paul in this situation where he's just kind of, he's like overwhelmed. He throws his hands up. He's trying to persevere. He's trying to be faithful. And he just, it doesn't feel like he's going anywhere. <coughs> and uh, one night, as he's sleeping in a vision, the Lord comes to him. He says these words. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. Um, some of us right now, we are in a situation where we are throwing our hands up. We got nothing more to give. We have given everything that we know to give and we see nothing happening and it's creating frustration and burnout and, and, and it feels horrible. And I, I just want to say to those this morning who are there, the words that the Lord speaks to Paul, do not be afraid, I am with you. I, these are not words that need to be preached, the words that need to be prayed. Heavenly Father, we, we, oh Lord, some of us are just spent. <coughs> and we're, we're so frustrated that we don't know where to put our foot next. And so Lord, we cry out to you in weakness this morning. Holy Spirit, please, please apply to our hearts the words you gave to Paul. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I am with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Lord provides comfort in the trenches of perseverance. By a fifth one last week. Contentment. Contentment. Um, the book of Acts ends in a fascinating way, and I won't go through all the uh, events that set this up, but we find Paul uh, at the end of Acts. He's under house arrest in Rome. Now here's a guy who has been commissioned to the Gentiles to go and, and spread the gospel, and here we find him basically in jail. His movement is restricted. Now that seems a little counterintuitive, right? How is it that Paul is going to carry out his mission that the Lord has commissioned him to if he's locked up and he can't go anywhere? And yet the last few verses of Acts tell us that people were coming to him day in and day out to be taught, to be discipled, uh, and so the word of God continued to go forth. Paul, Paul speaks to this uh, very directly in Philippians chapter 4 where, where he says, um, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance or situation I'm in. And I love Paul's language in Philippians 4. It's like it's almost like he's saying, come here, come here, come here, I got a secret. Let me tell you the secret. Come here, come here. The secret is I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So we come full circle, right? What do we say? The, the, the characteristic mark of perseverance is not about my strength, it's about the strength of Jesus in me. 
Uh, some of us, if we could change our situation right now, we would change it. But perhaps the Lord has us in a particular situation to teach us contentment as we draw upon His strength and not our own. Amen. Perseverance teaches us contentment. Alright, what's uh, number three? Last, last deal here. We looked at what perseverance is, we looked at what it creates, and so now we just kind of look at what it means. In other words, kind of what, what's, a, what's a practical takeaway from this? Um, this is where I think, again, the image of being on path is helpful. Because I, I think, to me, the takeaway question, one of the things that can help us learn to apply and cultivate perseverance in our lives is, is really by asking any, two questions at any given time. Number one, where am I on the path? Where am I on the path? Where, where are you on the path right now? If you had to characterize or describe your relationship with the Lord right now, how would you characterize it? How would you describe it? Maybe it's good. Maybe you feel a lot of life. Maybe you feel a lot of joy. Maybe you feel like your skills and gifts and abilities are being used and that's fulfilling. Maybe you're in a deep, dark hole and you feel hopeless and you feel dark and you feel cynical. But I, at any given time, all of us are somewhere on the path and so to learn to ask ourselves, hey, where, where am I on the path? Um, another, another way you could ask that that we've thrown out before is um, if I had to give a picture of what my soul looks like right now, what picture would I give? What does your soul look like? Does it look healthy? Does it look unhealthy? Um, and so then based on how you answer that question of where am I on the path, then I would ask, what is your next step? Based on wherever you're at on the path right now, what is your next step? Step. Now, here's how I would encourage you to think about that. I would encourage you to think about that through the exact grid that we've been preaching through over the past month. Maybe it's your next step um, is that you need to get into the Word because you are trying to go through the Christian life without any kind of foundation on the Scriptures, and that is a fool's errand. Um, maybe maybe uh, your next step on the path is to cultivate prayer in your life. Maybe the next step on your path is that you've been in isolation too much and you need to be surrounded by community. I mean, those are, the, those are the ways disciples are made. Proclamation, prayer, people. So as you think about what's the next step on, on, on the path right now for me, think about it in terms of those things. I, I would love for us, I'd love to see us adopt this kind of language so that we're having conversations about it all the time. So that in relationships that I'm in with people in my small group or people that I connect with here at Grace, at any given time, I can ask, I can ask them, um, hey, where are you on the path right now? And what's your next step? See, that's a discipling relationship. I mean, it's fun to get together and hang out and watch football. Do that, right? But along the way, throw out those questions. Hey, where are you on the path? And what's your next step? That takes casual relationships into discipling relationships. Uh, that's what we want to be about. We're all on the path together. And we're all called to help each other look to Jesus in that. Um, as I was preparing this sermon, I, I thought back to uh, my last big assignment in seminary. Um, I had to write a paper on Pilgrim's Progress. Anybody read Pilgrim's Progress? I, it was so bad that the teacher, the professor, called me in her office and said, I cannot allow you to graduate seminary with this bad of a paper. <laughs> One moment in my life, I had to go rewrite. Anyway. Um, that, that book, which I think was the most popular selling book behind the Bible for like 300 years or something, um, it's an allegory of um, a person's own path toward eternal life with God. And the, the, the character's name is Christian, and he encounters all these different things along the path, along the way. And, and, and I thought back to that paper, and I remember there was a, there was a quote um, out of that book that I, that I latched on to so, so tightly. 
um, that I think just kind of captures this essence of perseverance. I want to read it for you. You got to bear with the language, right? It's an old book. This hill, though high, I covet to ascend. The difficulty will not me offend. For I perceive the way to life lies here. Come, pluck up heart. Let's neither faint nor fear. Better, though difficult, the right way to go than wrong, though easy, for the end is woe. Well. May we persevere by looking to Jesus. May we lead each other a helping hand along the way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what great news that you are not only the founder of our faith, but you are the perfecter of our faith. What great news that is. That, that the Christian life is, is, is not just about being for, forgiven, but it is about growing and learning you, being prepared for the life that is to come, that, uh, that your resurrection um, puts your life into us when we turn to you by faith. What great news! What great news that is! And I ask that you would renew our hearts this morning as we consider that good news. That you have not left us alone. And though we may be in situations and circumstances that we would change if we could, though there are things that weigh us down and things that make us fear, you have not left us alone. So I ask that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation. And, and Lord, I ask that you would um, give us a, a passion to help one another in this. May we be those who, who care for one another and lend a helping hand to one another. Not those who bite and devour and discourage one another, but those who uh, engage together as your people, as your church, as we unite around who you are, Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, burn this within our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray.